when she was just 16 years old, Callie Rogers won nearly £2 million in the UK lottery. She'd been working on the till in a supermarket, but she quickly gave that up, as you can imagine, in order so she could spend her money on things like vacations and gifts and cosmetic surgery and, unfortunately, drugs. A decade later, Callie had just £2,000 in the bank. And by 2021, she was penniless and living on government benefits. And it's a story that has is very familiar, very similar to many people's stories who won massive amounts of money. So five years after Kentucky resident David Edwards won $27 million, he was penniless, living in a storage shed with his wife. Two years after Willie Hurt won $3 million, he was broke and he was charged with murder. And 11 years after John McGuinness from Scotland won £10 million, he owed more than £2 million and was about to get his house repossessed. <coughs> Excuse me. Tragically, many people who unexpectedly, unexpectedly become rich squander it all incredibly quickly and end up with nothing. But this morning, we're going to look at a far more extreme riches to rags story. We're going to think about someone who had far greater wealth than any lottery winner and yet experienced a far deeper poverty than any of us ever will. But incredibly, this person, he didn't lose everything through foolish decisions or extravagant self-indulgence or greed or addiction. Incredibly, he laid down all of this for you and for me. But that wasn't the end of his story. This story is a riches to rags and back to riches story. And as we read it in Philippians chapter 2, it's not just a truth for us to marvel at this morning. Incredibly, this is an example that God wants us to follow in our lives. Because each one of us are called to serve with a Christ-like attitude. So we're going to read Philippians chapter 2, verse 5 to 11, and Megan's going to come and she's going to read for us. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in very nature, God did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Thank you very much, Megan. Many people think that Paul was quoting here from a song, an early Christian hymn. Now we can't be sure who wrote it, whether it was Paul himself or if it was somebody else. And of course we don't know the tune. But what we do know is that these words are incredibly powerful and profound. They really stretch our our understanding of who Christ is and also what he has done. But we also know why Paul quoted this song here. This was not just a theology lesson. 
He didn't just want us to learn these incredible truths about Jesus or even move to worship in response to them. He wanted us to do more than that. He wanted to learn from them so that we would follow his example. This is what verse 5 says, your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus. Last week, if you were here with us, you remember that we were, we were called to stand, Paul said, if we were going to stand in the face of opposition, if we're going to be effective as a witness for Christ, then we need to be together in unity. We need to reject selfish ambition and vain conceit. We need to think about others as better than ourselves. And we need to look out not only to our own interests, but also to the interests of others. But how can we do that? How can we cultivate that attitude, that mindset, that outlook on life? Well, Paul wanted us to follow the example of Jesus. Now, of course, this doesn't mean that Jesus is only an example for us to follow. He's far more than that. He is our Creator. He is our Savior. He is our Lord. He is the one who saves us and and sanctifies us and will glorify us. He has and will accomplish far more than we could ever do. So we'll never be exactly like Jesus. But we are called to follow in his footsteps. We are called to serve in a way that's like him. He is the standard for how we should live. And we can see that truth kind of even at the beginning of our song. As Paul declared that Jesus is more than we could ever be. He is who being in very nature God. Some people, of course, claim that Jesus was just a good man or a a, a great teacher or a prophet or even an angel sent from God. But Paul knew his true identity in his personal and essential nature. Jesus is divine. He is God. He is the Son of God. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. Because all things were created by Him and for Him. He is before all things, and in Him all things hold together. As Paul says in Colossians 1. Jesus is our Creator God. He is the source and the purpose and the sustainer of this universe. And of course we can't step into that role. We'll never be like him in that way. But we can learn even from this first line of this song about what it means to to have the same attitude as, as Christ. This reminds us that humility is not about having a, a low self-esteem or a low self-worth. It's not about thinking of ourselves as nothing and worth nothing. Because Jesus always knew who he was. He was always aware of his true identity and worth. And for us, humility starts when we understand our true identity and worth. We are the crown of God's creation. We've been made in God's image. As as Genesis 1 says, God created man in his image. So we have intrinsic value and worth because we are image bearers of God. But of course, more than that, if we're here this morning and we've trusted in Jesus, we're not just people who've been created in the image of God, we're actually children of God. This is what John says in John chapter 1, verse 12. To all who believed in him, he gave the right to become children of God. 
Today we're forgiven and redeemed and justified and accepted into God's family. We are loved. We are valued. We are precious in His sight. So Jesus knew His true identity. So He knew that He deserved all of the praise and all of the glory. But, verse 6 goes on to say, He did not consider equality with God something to be grasped. He didn't cling on to what was rightfully His. He didn't use His status as equal with the Father for His own benefit or advantage. He said He was willing to lay aside what was His by right. His position and His status and His honour and His glory for the sake of others. Now, I don't think that comes naturally to any of us, do you? We're often encouraged to assert our rights, to demand what is ours, to fight for our privileges and position. But if we're going to have a Christ-like attitude, we need to be willing to release our rights for the benefit of others. Apostle Paul did this in his own life. He was an apostle. So as an apostle, he had the right to choose his own lifestyle in terms of whether he got married or not, whether he received the support of the churches that he was working for or not, or working in or not. But he told the church in Corinth, for example, but we did not use this right. We put up with anything rather than hinder the gospel of Christ. Paul was willing to set aside his rights for the sake of others. And are we willing to do the same? Are we willing to lose out so that others can gain? But Jesus, he didn't just release his rights. He also made himself nothing. Nothing. This literally means he emptied himself. So, we need to be clear here. That does not mean that he became less than divine, less than fully God. The Bible clearly teaches us that the the Son of God was nothing, was never less than fully God. But rather, in some way, he emptied himself of the privilege of, of deity, the privilege of being God. He humbled himself. He willingly concealed his glory, his power, his majesty. And he did this when he became human, being made in human likeness, verse 7. This is the the miracle of the incarnation that we'll we'll just never really fully get our heads around. That the eternal, all-powerful, all-present, all-knowing Son of God became a tiny little baby. That the creator and sustainer of this universe became dependent on His mother's provision and care on his stepdad's protection. That the Word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. That God became flesh with skin and bone. He was fully God and fully man. Experiencing all the limitations and struggles of our humanity. The hunger, the thirst, the tiredness, and the pain of our lives. And he did this to serve. T. 
taking the very nature of a servant. The word servant here literally is slave. The one who is in, in his very nature God became in his very nature a slave. The eternal Son of God left the perfections of heaven He laid aside the glory of his person and power. He emptied himself of the privileges of deity. He set aside the worship and the praise that he deserved. He experienced the struggle of humanity. All to serve us. To save us. Because he loved us. Jesus said the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. And that's the example that we're called to follow. This is what we're called to do. To humble ourselves. To lay aside our plans and our privileges, our rights and our expectations. To roll up her sleeves and serve others as a slave. To be like Paul and Timothy, who describe themselves here as servants of Christ Jesus. This is not about getting involved in a ministry just for a couple of hours a week. It's not an appeal to sign up for a role in our church community. Those things would be great, but that's not what this is about. This is a call to be a servant in our very nature. For it to be who we are in every aspect of our lives. At work, At home, in our neighborhoods, and in our church. In public, and in private. Not out of guilt, not out of duty, certainly not to try and earn our way to God, but out of love. Love for God love for others and in response to Christ's love for us. That's not easy to do. If we live this way, it will cost us. Some people might take advantage of us. We will lose out in our lives in some way. But we can never say that it costs too much. Because Jesus, the Son of God, didn't just become a slave. He also became our sacrifice. Verse 8, he became obedient to death. Jesus completely obeyed his Father's will, even to the point of death. Without limits. This was powerfully expressed in his his prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane. My Father, if it's possible, may this cup be taken from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. Total obedience. I think we can so often put limits on our obedience to Jesus. I'll follow you, Lord, as long as you don't ask me to do something too difficult or too painful or too embarrassing. I'll obey you as long as you bless me, as long as you look after me, as long as you look after my family, as long as I don't suffer. But conditional obedience is really no no obedience at all. Because we are still in charge. We still haven't accepted Christ's leadership in our lives. 
So instead, we are called to wholehearted obedience. Not as a way to salvation. This is not about trying to do something in order to be right with God. That's a gift of God's grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. But we are called to obey as a loving response to our salvation. Jesus said, if you love me, you will obey what I command. But of course, Jesus' servant attitude didn't just take him to death, but even to death on a cross. Jesus could go no lower than that. Crucifixion was such a painful and degrading form of execution. It was reserved for the lowest of people in that Roman society, especially to slaves. But so much more than that, The cross was a place of a curse. Galatians 3 says, Cursed is everyone who is hung on a tree. And so by dying on the cross, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. In selfless love and grace, Jesus willingly took upon himself our sin, our guilt, our shame. He was punished as our substitute. He suffered the separation from the Father that we deserved. And He died in our place. That's the depth to which Christ emptied Himself. From the glories of heaven to the curse of the cross. He did all of this for you and for me because He loved us. And this is the standard of selfless sacrifice that we are called to follow. John says in his letter, 1 John 3.16, Jesus Christ laid down His life for us. And we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers. Of course, we we want to shrink back from this. We want to try and find a way to minimize the the, the cost of this. To excuse it away. Say, oh well, it doesn't actually mean this. But this is what it means to follow Jesus. It is to lay down our rights, to humble ourselves, to become a servant, to obey God's call and give up our lives every day to serve others. This is the attitude of Christ. But of course this song doesn't end just with the sacrifice of Jesus, does it? Verse 9. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place. Gave him the name that is above every name. Jesus humbled himself. It was his own willing action. But in response to this, God exalted him. He gave him the highest place and the highest name. In his incarnation, Jesus concealed his glory. He willingly emptied himself of his position and privilege. But in his resurrection and in his ascension, God revealed the Son's glory. He honoured him and welcomed him to the place of position and privilege that was rightfully his. And as a result, one day, at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. That's what so many of us do willingly this morning, isn't it? We willingly and gladly bow before our risen and exalted Saviour and declare, Jesus Christ is Lord. We want to give Him the rightful place in our lives. 
But of course, in this world, many people don't do this. Many people still defy His rightful place in their lives. But one day, they will have to bow and acknowledge Him as Lord. Not as Savior, but as their judge. And on that day, Jesus' true identity will be revealed and He'll be honored by every knee and every tongue. And this is the principle of God's kingdom. Listen to what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 23. Whoever exalts himself will be humbled. And whoever humbles himself will be exalted. When we exalt ourselves, when we demand our rights, when we focus on our needs, do what we want, then ultimately we will be humbled. If someone has, someone has trusted in Jesus, then of course they won't lose their salvation in this sense. That's a gift of God's grace. But on that final day, their work and their accomplishments will count for nothing because they'll burn up like wood, hay and straw. It says about a believer in Jesus who does not serve Christ, he will suffer loss. Paul says that in 1 Corinthians 3. But if a believer humbles himself today, if they release their rights, take the place of a servant, obey God and lay down their lives for others, then one day God will reveal the quality of their service and He will receive His reward. Whoever exalts himself will be humbled. Whoever humbles himself will be exalted. When we serve Christ with a true, with the right motivation and a right heart, there is a cost involved. But ultimately, in eternity, we will never lose out. Even if nobody else sees it here, even if nobody else acknowledges it here on earth, even if we can see no fruit, no value in it here on earth, Jesus says, my Father will honour the one who serves me. But here's finally the ultimate result of this, the exaltation of Jesus. Did you see at the end of this, this song, verse 11? It was to the glory of God the Father. Through his willing humbling of himself and God's rewarding of him, God's true character, His mind-blowing wisdom and power and grace and love are revealed. God is glorified. This was Jesus' prayer just before He went to the cross. He prayed in John 17, Glorify your Son, that your Son may glorify you. This was Jesus' heart. And today we can know that God will honour those who serve Him. But we recognise that none of us deserve that honour. None of us have really earned it. After all, all the opportunities and calling to serve God and the abilities and energy we have to do that, all of that comes from God Himself. As Paul said, by the grace of God I am what I am. But the incredible generosity of God is that He will honour us for what, by, what we, by His grace, have been able to do. But that's why, when we're willing to let God honour us at the right time, in the right way, the ultimate glory goes to God. That's what Peter says in 1 Peter 4.11. If anyone serves, he should do that with the strength God provides 
so that in all things God may be praised through Jesus Christ. So Jesus is the ultimate riches to rags to riches story. He is the eternal Son of God who stepped into humanity to become a slave. Who humbled himself to become our sacrifice. But now is exalted and reigning supreme because he did all of this willingly in obedience to his Father and in love for us. And so today he is our standard calls us to follow in his footsteps, to humble ourselves in obedient service so that at the proper time God will exalt us for his honour and for his glory.